Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Sorry about the coffee. Welcome back to Higher Chemistry. Um, we are finished bonding in elements, and we are now going to move on to the next logical step, which is bonding in compounds. Um, the, we're going to start with something that's... Uh, we're going to run through the types of bonding. There are only three. Um, there are ionic bonding that we covered in National 5, there's joint covalent networks, and there's covalent individual molecules. Very similar to bonding in um, elements. We're not going to talk about what happens when you mix two metals together, by the way. Um, if you're interested, you can go and find that out yourself. It just creates an alloy, but we're not going to go into the chemistry of that. It's surprisingly complex. So let's take a review of these types of bonding and compounds, starting with the easiest one, which is number one, ionic bonding. Now, ionic bonding is usually, you notice that's a weasel word there, it's a metal and it's a non-metal. Uh, the metal tends to have one, two, or three outer electrons. Non-metals tend to have five, six, or seven outer electrons. Don't know if you've actually realised this before, but that means that metals, that's the reason why metals form positive ions. They will lose one, or lose two, or lose all three of the outer electrons, and they create positive ions. Non-metals will either gain um, three, or two, or one electron, respectively here, which means they create negative ions. And of course, once you've created all these positive and negative ions, they all lock together in a big, giant, ionic lattice. Um, should have had one printed out earlier on. Sorry about that, folks. Um, this is your classic Rubik's Cube interpretation of it. Uh, although, do you know what? I'm going to pause this video and go and print one out, actually. Excuse me. And we're back with um, two different representations. This much nicer than the cube I was trying to draw. And this one, which is actually much closer to reality, that is a funky pattern, isn't it? I'd love that on the on the roof in the lab. Once we get back to the lab, of course, which will happen in the very near future, hopefully. So these are ionic comp. This is an ionic compound. Two different representations. Um, my point being that the thing that holds these ions together to their neighbour is electrostatic attraction. One's positive, one's negative. When you take um, when you take an ionic compound like this and try to apply voltage to it, if you apply a positive potential here and a negative side here, the ions do want to move, but they can't because they're all locked together at the moment. They're all jammed uh, to the neighbour by very strong electrostatic attraction and they, they can't move around. However, of course, if you were to dissolve it in water or, of course, melt it, if you apply enough heat, you can melt salt. Uh, if you were with me in third year, that's what we did in a test tube. You can get molten salt. Um... And if you, so, uh, if you dissolve or melt ionic compounds, the ions can move. In other words, they become electrical conductors. So a very quick review of this. The properties of ionic compounds, the, the forces that hold them together are quite strong, so therefore they tend to have high melting and boiling points. They are usually solids at room temperature. Um, they are, when they're solid, they are electrical insulators. They don't conduct. They want to, but they can't. However, if you are to melt or dissolve, if they dissolve, of course, not all ionics do dissolve in water, then they become conductors. That's just a summary of last year, so I won't bore you with any more. Let's move on to our um, let's move on to our second type of bonding in, com in compounds. That was number one. Let's move on to number two. Um, and I'm showing my terrible lack of preparation again because I'm going to have to pause the video and I will go and get a, a nice diagram of a giant covalent network compound. There are two the SQA would like you to be familiar with. Um, one of them, when the lockdown is released, we can all take a gentle stroll on the surface of one of them because it's great. Uh, wonderful rest and relaxation area populated entirely under your feet by one of these. Excuse me a second, and I'll show you. And we're back. Um, this is the first of our giant covalent networks that I'd like you to know about. Um, silicon dioxide, otherwise known in real life as sand. Or quartz. Or by quite a few other names. It's all basically chemically the same thing. Um, we can see um, silicon atoms uh, and oxygen atoms. Silicon atoms with a valency 4. So they've got four bonds. Oxygen atoms only have valency two, so that's why these, they just have two bonds. They only have four. Please remember that this repeats 
indefinitely. It doesn't end. I quite like this one because usually they end with like just an atom, and that's not right. It just keeps going on. Um, how far does it go on? Well, basically to infinity, otherwise known as the edge of the crystal, which means if you have a grain of sand, that's one single molecule, effectively. And if you have a crystal of quartz, you know, the size of a bucket, it's still one single molecule. That's why we tend to just call them giant covalent networks, because the whole thing, strong covalent bonds holding everything together. Yes, I know, LDFs are still there. I did say that LDFs exist between every atoms and molecules, but we don't care about LDFs because they are vastly outweighed by these covalent bonds, which is what you would have to break if you wanted to try and melt or physically damage this. And as I said before, good luck with that. That's why sand and other giant covalent networks are so physically strong. They have sky-high melting points. Um, so melting and boiling points in the thousands of degrees. They're most definitely solids at room temperature. Um, their electrical conductivity, because they are covalent, uh, they never conduct. I don't care what you do to them. Leave them as a solid, try and dissolve them. It's not going to happen. Melt them. Yeah, that can be done. Um, doesn't care. There are no charges in this network. There's no positives, no negatives, so therefore it's not going to conduct electricity. So electrical conduction, never. Um, and I did see you required to know two of them. One of them is SiO2, silicon dioxide, famously used in sandpaper, and silicon carbide is the other one. Valency 4, valency 4. Swap them over, simplify them, you get this. This means that in silicon carbide, the ratio of silicon to carbon is one to one. Uh, this is incredibly tough stuff. Uh, I've got a few drills with the end that's been replaced by silicon carbide, and it just drills through everything. So um, this uh, reflects some of their... Um, so they're physically very strong, because, as I said, you're trying to break covalent bonds. This makes them perfect for abrasives. That's why we use sand on sandpaper. Abrasives, spell it right here, there we go. Uh, much of my youth was spent trying to fix rust on my mini, so I'm very familiar with sandpaper. Um, two different types, if you ever come across it, uh, just in real life, you know, the yellow stuff really is silicon dioxide on it. The black uh, sandpaper, in inverted commas, is actually silicon carbide. Um, and we're done for uh, giant covalent networks. Excuse me a second. So, uh, bonding and compounds, so far. We have dealt with ionic, we have dealt with giant covalent networks. Shouldn't we be dealing with these? Before we deal with number three, there is an idea... Oh, sorry, I'll just stop the camera from shaking so it doesn't induce motion sickness. There is an idea I need to um, call back on. Uh, where we indulge in more hilarity uh, at my expense. Do we remember this concept? Electronegativity. Where in the video I compared myself to Chris Hemsworth and I said that uh, I was a, the analogy I was using is that we have a certain amount of pulling power on, or he does, on the shared pair of electrons. Now, I also dropped a hint that when you have a molecule like chlorine, for example, where the two um, atoms have the same pulling power, yeah, fine, the shared pair of electrons are exactly equally pulled. But then I dropped a hint and I said, hmm, I wonder what happens if it wasn't equal pull. Now, you can't get unequal pull in elements, obviously, duh, because the two atoms are the same. However, we're no longer dealing with elements. Now, um, what we have here is a molecule of, say, hydrogen chloride, HCl. And if we, let's put this here just now, um, if we draw the two atoms, we're going to have hydrogen. We tend to draw it like this, traditionally. Hydrogen and chlorine. And shared electron. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Fine. Only if we call back to electronegativity values, we find the electronegativity of chlorine is 3.5. Electronegativity of hydrogen, I believe, is 2.2. I'll just double check that later on. Um, my point being that there is a fairly large difference. There is a delta in the electronegativity here. So we have got a large... Delta just means difference, of course. I'm just stealing the triangle from the physics department. It saves me writing out difference each time. So there's a large delta En here. So what? 
Well, at the moment, with the way I casually drew it, I just popped these two electrons in the centre. Only, <laughs> what we could do is relabel these atoms, couldn't we? We could relabel that as me, and have this as Mr. Hemsworth. And this is the, the pool, this, this is the shared pair of electrons that we are both trying to attract. Now, what I should really do is redraw it much more representatively. Um, chlorine, hydrogen, shared pair of electrons. Now, if we take a closer look at this, we can see that these electrons are most definitely not equally shared anymore. So, what have we created here? What's happened to this little molecule of hydrochloric acid? Don't shout at me, by the way, in case you're thinking, are not acids ionic? Hydrochloric acid is actually gas in its pure form. The form that you use it in, it's always dissolved in water, and when you dissolve it, it falls apart like that, and now you have a hydrogen ion and a chloride ion. But that's okay. We're just considering the bonding inside the molecule today. Um, so we can, uh, we can say that our molecule here has got all its electrons pretty much all at this end, and almost no electrons at this end. Sounding familiar? Delta plus, delta minus. We've created a dipole. In other words, we've created a molecule which has got a slightly positive end and a slightly slightly negative end, sorry, do apologise, and a slightly positive end. Shouldn't try and think ahead, it's not one of my specialties. Um, so this molecule is now polar. So this is a polar molecule. Why is the molecule polar? Because the covalent bond is no longer equally sharing these electrons. We have permanent unequal shared electrons caused by a large difference in electronegativity. So this molecule has a permanent dipole. Unlike, if you cast permanent uh, dipole, cast your minds back to uh, LDFs, London Dispersion Forces, the electrons were constantly mo moving, so therefore we had temporary dipoles. Not anymore, we don't. These electrons are just stuck to this, much closer to this chlorine than they are to the hydrogen, forever. So there's a permanent dipole, and we have created what's called a polar covalent bond. So this is a polar covalent bond. And as a result of that, we now have a polar molecule. And this is all down to a big difference in electronegativities of the two atoms that made up this molecule. Is it possible to have a compound that's got zero electronegativity difference? Yes, it is. If you go and search out your uh, electronegativity table in, uh, in the data bond, uh, the, sorry, in the data book, I'll just go and print one. So, data book, uh, page 11. Oh, we did refer to this before. Um, not sure if you can see it on this scale. We'll try and zoom in a wee... Oh, uh, that's a bit too much. I'll try and zoom in a wee fraction for you. There we go. Um, in red, you see... <laughs> by the way, I'm going to apologise for that. I had 3. That's what happens when you rely on your memory. Chlorine's not 3.5, chlorine's 3, but that's okay. Still a large difference. Um, so, we've got chlorine with 3, and we've got nitrogen with 3, and we've got sulphur with 2.5, and, and we've also got carbon with 2.5. So my question was, is it possible... Let's zoom back out. My question was, is it possible to create a compound with completely non-polar covalent bonds? The answer is yes, there is. Because some elements have identical electronegativities, but generally speaking, they all tend to be slightly different. Uh, and a quick recap of that, if you have a large electronegativity difference, you end up having a polar covalent bond, because these pair of, this pair of electrons is no longer equally shared. This leads to a polar molecule, in this case, with because the molecule has got a permanent dipole. One end always slightly positive, one end always slightly negative. So, is that done? That doesn't seem that complex, does it? There's one more thing I need to throw at you. 
Here's a question. Okay, so here's the question of the day, of course. Do polar covalent bonds always lead to a polar molecule? In the last example, the answer was yup. And you might be tempted to say, well, of course, they always do. This bond here is polarized. There's more negative here than here. That means the molecule is polarized. Yeah, but it's a pretty simple molecule, though, isn't it? Maybe there's something else at play here. Um, I've got a variety of models here. Fortunately, I was able to have some molly, molly mods at home when I was helping my son um, before everything went wrong. So we've got, um, uh, got four molecules to have a look at here. You have to ask yourself a question. Um, is my molecule completely symmetrical? It's a bit like a tug-of-war team. Imagine if you had a tug-of-war team where there was a center point in the rope and you had team A and team B and they were equally matched clone to, <laughs> if you cloned a tug-of-war team um, then, then these guys would be pulling this direction with an equal force as this and this wouldn't actually go anywhere. In chemistry we can extend that to a three-dimensional tug-of-war team because have a look at this. If I hold this up to the camera, let's see, if I hold this up to the camera, at first this molecule seems to have one atom at the top here. This, by the way, this is CCl4, carbon tetrachloride. So it seems to have one atom of chlorine at the top and three atoms of chlorine at the bottom here. So my question was, is my molecule completely symmetrical? This looks like the answer to that is no. Why are we worried about the symmetry thing? Well, basically, if you have a completely symmetrical molecule, then there will be equal pulls in all directions, and you will have a non-polar molecule, despite the individual bonds being polarized. So let's have a look at this for a second. This bond here, this equivalent bond here, is polarized. So is this one, so is this one, so is this one, because there's a decent difference in the electronegativity. Carbon's electronegativity, let me just double check, because I got it wrong last time. Carbon's electronegativity is 2.5. Chlorine's electronegativity is 3. So there's a decent di difference here. That means these bonds will be polar. However, if I am to do with this with the molecule, if I just set the molecule on the desk there and then flip it over, you can actually tell they all look identical to each other. So the answer to my question, is this molecule totally symmetrical? Believe it or not, although it doesn't look like it when I hold it that way, the answer is yes. Because if I hold it a slightly different way, hopefully you can see. This is why the, the use of the models is so helpful and why I'm really glad I've got some here. You can see it's symmetrical in this dimension, this plane, this plane, and this plane. So there's an equal tug of war going on, and the center carbon is the, the center of the tug of war, as it were. So all the bonds are polarized, but because the pull is equal and opposite from all the chlorines, then this molecule is actually non-polar. Um, another example of that is carbon dioxide. Let's try and ignore the direction of the bendy bonds, by the way. I do apologize, it's the best we can do. Carbon dioxide has, is symmetrical that way, symmetrical that way, and symmetrical that way. So carbon dioxide is also a non-polar molecule. Despite these bonds being polarized, the overall molecule is not polarized. The reason these bonds are polarized, by the way, is because carbon having 2.5, oxygen's electronegativity is 3.5. So yeah, in fact, even more polar bonds than this. And yet the overall molecule is not polar because it is symmetrical. The pull is equal and exactly opposite. If we have a look at these guys, on the other hand, we find that water is indeed symmetrical in this dimension, but there's no way that it can be regarded as symmetrical there. There's one oxygen and two hydrogens here, so water, depending on the difference here, may be polarized. Let's have a quick look at the electronegativities. Oxygen, we said before, was 3.5, and hydrogen is 2.2. So yeah, water is definitely going to be polar. This is another molecule we've come across before in the past. My apologies for the colour not being correct. This is ammonia. Now, similarly to water, um, ammonia has got three hydrogens. It's a pyramidal shape. Three hydrogens sticking down at the bottom and nothing sticking up at the top. I'm hoping you can see 
that it's sort of symmetrical that way, yeah. You can't tell if you're spinning it, but as soon as you do that, oh yeah, you can see you've tipped it over. So ammonia is also a polar molecule. Um, and in fact, I'm trying to condense this into a sort of flowchart here. So, is my molecule polar? That's the question of the day. Here's a phrase for a t-shirt. Is my molecule polarized? Ask yourself this question first. Is the molecule completely symmetrical in all three dimensions, like these guys? If the answer to that question is, yes, it is symmetrical, then nope, your molecule will never be polar. Who cares, by the way, whether the molecule is polar or not? In the next video, we will have a look at some serious property differences uh, in the real world caused by this lack of polarity. Um, and the other side of the question was, is my molecule pol uh, polarized? Is it com completely symmetrical in all three dimensions? No, it's not. But that's, that applies to these guys here. Then you have to ask yourself a second question. Is there a large delta EN? And the answer to that is, let's go with a yes here. If the answer to that is yes, then your molecule is indeed polar. If the answer to that is no, and it can happen, that's why we looked up the electronegativities and found that some of the elements do have identical EN numbers. So it can happen. So if there's not a large, then it is non-polar. Despite not being totally symmetrical. The reason it's non-polar, of course, is the individual bonds are not polarised. If there's not a large difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. And that's all I want to go uh, with on this video. Um, so, symmetry, it turns out, affects uh, the properties of molecules. Symmetry being a math concept, uh, how about that, seriously affects different behaviours in the real world of molecules. In the next video, we're going to have a look at the consequences of that. In the current climate, by the way, I'm going to explain precisely why washing your hands with soap is more effective than washing your hands with uh, bleach to get rid of the coronavirus. There's a fascinating real-world consequence of all this symmetry and polarity nonsense. So, very quick uh, summary of today, guys. Uh, what we looked at is we're now looking at bonding in compounds. We started off with a review of ionic bonding. We looked at giant covalent networks because they're simple. There's two of them you need to know, silicon dioxide and silicon carbide. You need to know their physical properties. And lastly, I was going to do individual covalent molecules, but there's this subtlety caused by a difference in electronegativity. You can create what's called polar covalent bonds. And sometimes, if the bond is polarized, the whole molecule ends up being polarized. I say sometimes, and that depends on the symmetry of the molecule, that is a, this flowchart is a review of the symmetry and the effect it has on polarity. And in the next video, we'll.